Okay, hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Tio Yi Ling, Senior Fellow with SENSE, and will be Chair for today's meeting, webinar meeting. I'm particularly pleased to be able to introduce Carolyn Kamoinj, uh, Managing Director Asia for Hume Brophy, an international communications firm specializing in public affairs and public relations. Carolyn has over 20 years of experience in the communications industry and her communications career includes in-house and agency experience and she has consulted for some of the world's leading brands in sectors from finance to technology, aviation to healthcare and fast-moving consumer goods. She is also a trusted advisor to numerous public sector organizations and has extensive experience in regional and integrated communication strategy and planning and is also acknowledged for her expertise in executive and crisis communications. Carol is a graduate of the University of Hull where she read law and she'll be speaking about the topic agility and authenticity in crisis communications, which is highly relevant for the times we are existing in now. So over to you, Carol. So I wanted to start essentially by um, looking at the, the state of play, looking at what's going on with information consumption and then what's happening with news making as well. I think um, a lot of us would want to get a sense of what's happening in the newsroom at the moment um, with regard to this particular crisis and how news organizations are operating. Um, those of us who have communications roles will particularly be interested in understanding how the whole business of news making has changed in the context of this crisis. Um, I then want to move on to disinformation and narrative disruption. I think um, that's a very big part of what we're dealing with in terms of the volume of information that we have these days. Uh, disinformation, misinformation, um, and narrative disruption is something that, um, that all of us are going to encounter at some point um, because of the nature of the, of the speed with which information is being shared, the volume of information being shared. Sometimes there is going to be some, um, some manipulation behind it, and sometimes it's just very well-meaning mean people sharing information that uh, may not necessarily be accurate. Um, with that, then, I would like to take a look at um, what it means to create agile communication structures um, in the current context and, um, and essentially what it means um, for organizations to be able to respond in a timely manner to a very rapidly evolving situation. Then um, I think what's really important at a time like this, at a, at a, in the middle of a crisis that is so deeply personal in nature, is for us to have a look at what it means to strike that balance between humane and factual communication. And finally, we'll take a look at some of the leadership communication imperatives. So um, <laughs> I think when we start with the state of play, um, as this began to unfold, this sits on my coffee table. Um, I buy the edition of the world in whatever year, every year. And, um, and it didn't occur to me till about early March how completely blindsided we all were by this. If you go back and have a look at this, um, the, the words virus and COVID don't even appear. Um, on the cover. And, um, and so the one thing that is probably going to define all of our lives um, for this year at least uh, was something so, so out of the blue in a sense. And I know we all have our theories about is this really a black swan or not? Um, but uh, the fact is we sort of didn't see this coming. Um, and it is possibly the thing that is, that is going to have the biggest, most definitive effect on all of us on a personal level, on a professional level, and certainly for governments. Um, so when we look at the information consumption trends um, at the moment, we, what we are seeing is um, just unprecedented levels of information flowing through all channels. Uh, the source of the data is uh, to Kantar, who are a media agency, media intelligence agency, recently published their COVID-19 barometer, which I think spanned um, a sample of 30 countries and uh, a number of tens of thousands of respondents. And um, this is some of the data that, that was shared. Web browsing up 70%, TV viewing up 63%, social media engagement up 61%, WhatsApp traffic up 51%, Facebook usage up 37%. Um, and this is over just um, the, first, the first few months of this year leading up to now. Now, um, 
I, I think we can, we all instinctively know this data to be accurate. Uh, TV viewing could be a factor of us wanting more information or also just a factor of us being home more. Um, all of this actually could be a, 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 in equal parts, both, both of those things, but no doubt this is the situation that we have right now in terms of the amount of information flowing through all channels as well. Now, what does the effect that that has had in the newsrooms? Essentially, I don't think we've ever seen a situation where global news has been so dominated by a single issue. Um, I think whatever channels you're looking at, whatever channels it is that you are consuming information from, you're seeing that pretty much all news is COVID-19 related. Um, the newsroom operations have changed. Journalists are working from, um, from home. Um, engagements have moved to virtual. Uh, so what we're seeing is the impact of us being able to then engage with journalists in the way that we used to has really changed. So take, for example, how we've, uh, the, the pitching cycle in the past, what would have happened is we would have gone, well, here's a great story that we need to talk to the journalists about. All right, let's see that, in, that information with them first. And the first thing we would have done is gone off, put a call into a journalist, hey, we've got a person who can talk to you about XYZ things. Can we grab a coffee, introduce them to you, hear what they have to say, see if that's interesting to you. Then we go off and develop that lead and we say, well, did you like what he said? Did you find that interesting? Can we build on that for you? And, um, and we supply them with more information. They start to think about a storyline. They come back to you. They go, right, I'm thinking about going about it this way. Um, can you maybe give me a little bit more of this information? And then eventually at some point, this results in a story. Or even if there's a press release, if there's an announcement to be made, for example, um, we would be we would be having a press conference. Um, all of that has changed. If we were doing interviews, we'd say, "Come sit down and, and interview a spokesperson." And all of that has moved to virtual. With that moving to virtual, there is some drop off in engagement for sure, because what you are seeing is that you are getting a sense of, of journalists just thinking, well, they can't get the same thing from, you know, from spokespeople over, over a virtual platform that they can if they were just sitting across from them. Also, just how many Skype calls can a journalist be doing in a day, right? So a lot of them are just, um, you know, a lot of them are also then just saying, just shying away from this, this mode of communication that they, that would have just been a natural thing in the past. Now, because, um, because of working remotely, the whole process of news making has changed a little bit in that, you know, the deadlines have to move forward to account for somebody not being sat right there with you. You can't have editorial meetings anymore where you've got 15 people in a room and you can say, here's a story I want to lead with. Um, you know, editors are probably receiving things virtually and not, not, therefore it takes a little bit more time because they can't just be sitting there going, nix this story, move this up to page two, um, you know, infuse this angle into this and work on it. All of that has just been affected, which means that the, the deadlines, they're longer production times. And so the deadlines have moved up a little bit, which means that we, as people who are speaking to the media, have to be a little bit, um, a little bit more accommodating of that. We have to be less, less impatient about when our stories ink. There's also just a huge pipeline. I know for a fact that um, one of the popular um, op-ed channels that we have here, or rather one of the popular op-ed columns in, in a local paper, um, they're, they're talking about three to four months before you might get your op-ed um, published because, uh, because there is quite a pipeline of people just pouring it into, pouring, pouring their stories in through op-eds. So we've got to be a little bit more patient and we've got to also realize that journalists who were used to working with a certain way are getting used to now having to maybe make five phone calls to get the same information they could have maybe got um, if, if they were able to be boots on ground, essentially. Um, but we are starting to see a trend um, now when not all stories have to have a coronavirus angle. Um, feel good stories are now in demand. Um, I think that is part of the late stage of, of, or what we hope is the late stage anyway, of, of us uh, being in this particular uh, cycle of this pandemic. Um, and essentially um, the, the newsrooms are now saying, right, we've pretty much 
told the, the early stage stories. We've pretty much told the, here's what everyone has to do stories and all of that. Um, now we're moving into the stage where essentially we, uh, there was some appetite for the feel good stories um, that are out in the community. I think we do still see though that a lot of those stories are still anchored in something that is connected to the pandemic. So, uh, so we are essentially still seeing um, some connection back to that that is occupying the most mind share. In Singapore, just as an example of what's happening with the, uh, with the newsrooms here, um, SPH has implemented uh, five initiatives. So um, as of around February, I think they started to split their team operations and started to have people come in in rotations. And so now the, the impact of that is obviously that you don't have as many people working on as many stories. And so the pipeline of the number of stories that they could work on at any one point in time started to dry out a little bit. And they were like, well, I'm gonna have to hold that. It's not critical right now. We only have X number of people to work on the number of stories and things like that. Um, then essentially, uh, they, you know, they start to give uh, moving to staff, um, having the option to work um, at, at uh, option from, you know, work from home uh, locations and things like that. So then they had to, then they had to get everyone ready to use new IT um, and all of that. Um, and uh, what we also found was that, so take, for example, the radio stations that sit under SPH, um, they were doing phone-in phone in interviews where they normally would have had the guest come into the studio. They were now doing phoner interviews. Now, these are, these are less preferable for us, honestly, on the communication side of things. It's our least favorite format. Um, it's very hard for a spokesperson to stay focused on a, on a, you know, on a phone interview. We find they tend to get distracted easily. Uh, there's always the, uh, the risk of somebody not hearing something correctly. The, the spokesperson doesn't hear the question correctly. Um, the, the, the interviewer doesn't hear the response correctly. There's just way too much risk in, in phone interviews, but these are now de rigueur for, uh, for particularly for radio broadcast interviews as well. And then when it came to TV interviews, we were seeing that, um, that uh, the interviews were initially were happening offsite. So we had a couple of interviews for, for clients which happened um, either on the grounds of MediaCorp um, where you know it was outdoors and um, and there, there was just uh, no you know, this wasn't happening in the studio or in a confined location so we had actually offered a location within uh, the client's home and um, they said no nope, we would prefer to be outdoors and in an open space so um, so you've got to again you know as a spokesperson you've got to be ready to deal with with that sort of thing it's you know you used to you've been trained to go into a studio and to and to look at a particular camera and things like that and now you're sitting in a garden and you've got to you've got to have your best corporate game face on and it's not always the easiest to manage um, and then um, and now they've stopped that entirely as well to in order to um, ensure that the crew are safe. Uh, they have now moved to a situation where essentially uh, the, all the interviews are being done over over virtual channels. And, um, and that again presents a, a, a new set of challenges, which we'll talk later about in terms of uh, leadership communications. Now, in terms of disinformation and narrative disruption now. Um, I think it's completely, um, completely incredible to me that while the White House has a, a press briefing, there is an, there is an actual fact checking, like real time live fact checking happening. Uh, this has never happened before. And um, the fact that it is even necessary now is, is slightly uh, disconcerting to say the least. Um, fortunately, that is quite an isolated incident. We don't see, um, we don't see global um, newsrooms having to employ that uh, across other countries. Um, but what we, what we do see is that disinformation and misinformation is growing relative to this. And these are just some of the themes that we have seen uh, related to COVID-19. First of all, I think disinformation and the connection to panic buying. I mean, if someone can still, I think the big question mark for me is still our attachment to toilet paper and, um, and why we panic bought that stuff. I, I, that is still, I, it might remain actually one of the mysteries of our lifetime. Um, but I think <laughs> we, uh, I think the strongest theory I've heard so far was that a celebrity um, in uh, Hong Kong had tweeted a picture of her 
um, having gone to a supermarket and said, oh, I've, you know, I'm all stocked up on my toilet paper. And then I, somehow everyone went, oh, yeah, that's right. What if I run out of toilet paper? And then, hello, global panic buying. Um, so, but what we have also seen, I mean, I, I recall being in, in a supermarket on a Friday, completely unaware that there had been um, a, a rumor going around that the PM, uh, PM Lee was going to make an announcement or make an address at 4 p.m. Now, I had no idea this was happening. I had popped out to the supermarket um, before the restrictions uh, had been tightened. I popped out to the supermarket and there were just a lot of people there. And, um, and I thought it's a bit odd because it was Friday and it was 1 p.m. and it was before we had all moved fully to work from home. So, you know, it didn't really make any sense to me. And I texted a friend and I said, what is this about? And, um, and she replied, so I think it has to do with this rumor going around that PM Lee is going to make an announcement at 4 p.m. So it literally just took a rumor spreading through, and he didn't actually that day, um, but it literally just took a rumor spreading um, to, to send everybody into the, into the supermarkets, panicking about the things that, that, we, uh, that we thought we might not be able to get our hands on. Um, and, and I think for a few weeks, we did see a, a repeated cycle of speculation about um, about a prime ministerial address at a particular time. Um, I think three out of the four times that I was told that that was going to happen, it didn't happen. And people would would even share WhatsApp messages that were erroneous um, or had somehow been faked um, to make it look like an official announcement. And, um, and we'll talk about personal responsibility to fact check things later as well. But what really annoyed me about that was that before you forward it, it's just that easy to go to one of the official government sources and just ask yourself like, okay, is this actually, no, okay, it's not actually happening. Maybe I won't forward this message. But, you know, people were just forwarding it. And with that going, oh, we're going to Doscon Red, you know, and all of that panic set in. Now, um, uh, disclaimer, Blackbird AI, where I got this, um, this uh, information is a partner agency to us. Um, they have a methodology for detecting whether something is, um, in their words, synthetically amplified. They use that as a measure of whether or not something is, um, is either um, is disinformation um, and they have an index and so um, they have two reports which you can access through their website which they have looked at in terms of certain themes that were amplified through this crisis. Uh, some of them are named there the bioweapons conspiracy, uh, panic, um, you know, that, uh, well, you know, people, people saying that uh, this was the Democrats in, Amer in America creating unnecessary panic and um, it's okay for us to go out and without, without a mask and, um, and even de-digitization of the media. So, um, so if, but I think what was stark for me was that between the February 2nd to 14th period and the February 27th to March 12th period that they tracked, the increase in manipulated content um, from 2.6 million, it's a slightly uh, longer period in the second frame, obviously, um, but from 2.67 million tweets, which were manipulated content to 18.8 million tweets, um, you know, of manipulated content. Um, so they, so the way that they look at this is also the nature of the information that's being spread and then also um, whether it is synthetically amplified. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting way to kind of qualify uh, whether or not information is, um, is disinformation. I think um, one of the interesting things um, that we have seen particularly come up through this crisis, I think most of you will probably be familiar with this pandemic. Um, certainly, um, I received it at least four times um, through various WhatsApp groups and, and, and channels. Um, Plandemic, for those who are not familiar, is a documentary that was made um, essentially, essentially espousing a conspiracy theory around, um, around how this is all you know, part of the broader vaccination conspiracy. Um, they had an expert speak, an expert who has now been widely discredited. Um, but the reason it went viral was because a lot of people who, um, who were aligned with this particular conspiracy theory and agenda put a lot of effort through it towards amplifying it. So what you're going to see is a concerted pushback from authentic media sources on this particular documentary and the way that it is being pushed 
through particular media sources um, currently. So if you try to find the documentary on YouTube, you won't. Um, if you also now just search Plandemic, you will see that almost every major media like Forbes, um, The Atlantic, a number of, of other uh, major um, uh, uh, media sources that also deal with, you know, with a lot of opinion uh, pieces have put out pieces on why it's important that we understand how fake this is. What's interesting, though, is, is what it reveals to us about the nature of disinformation. So essentially, um, what this video has, is, uh, this is an extract from the Forbes article. It does outline for us uh, very clearly what makes misinformation really successful. It taps into people's uncertainty. I'm not sure. I think this might be something. Oh, look at all the coincidences. I'll be honest. Somebody sent me the David Icke interview, the first one um, with London Real in the very early days of the of the crisis, and um, and you know there, there was just a lot of stuff in there that made me think, huh? Can that really all be coincidence? Um, thankfully, my higher intelligence prevailed, um, and I and I just sort of said, nah. And, um, and left it because now um, David Icke, who is also in, you know, in one of the big uh, conspiracy theorists of, of our time, um, is now being banned on most social media platforms because people just see the, the narratives that they are putting forward as wholly irresponsible in a time of extreme crisis. Also, the, the, you see, in the past, it was really easy for us to spot fake news and fake information because it looked very you know, it just looked very put together on somebody's laptop, you know, in half an hour with some very, very shoddy editing tools. Um, the, the threat actors have gotten a lot more sophisticated in the way that they are that they are packaging up information. So things look way more polished now. And so when you when you look at something like that and you think to yourself, Mm, that's interesting. Someone must have put a lot of effort into this. There must actually be some validity to this. Some time ago, I think we're talking about two or three years ago now, BBC um, India did a, a survey and, um, and they found that where people used to mistrust paid information, that was changing um, because um, essentially people now looked at paid information as, well, if you paid to put that information out there, then you, mu you must want to be a legitimate organization and this must be worth putting money behind. So it was, it was becoming increasingly you know, difficult to tell the authenticity of information when people are packaging up and promoting it through channels in this incredibly professional looking way. And, um, and finally, it just, you know, it looks at, um, um, it exploits um, effective methods of, of uh, persuasion. It uses things like fear, it, you know, it, um, it, it also just, um, just feeds into every little trigger mechanism that we have right now. And, um, and essentially, um, this is what has made this documentary incredibly successful in going viral. But it, this, I think, if you can, um, you know, it's a very good, it's a very good read from all of the media houses right now who are putting out information on how to there's there's one article which literally says what to say to people who tell you that you have to listen to this video and it has actual rebuttals and i think that's that's pretty um pretty awesome so um so in the face of this influx of communication um and also uh in the face of as much as we need to communicate from an organizational perspective particularly if you are a public sector organization what is the most effective way for us to make sure that the right messages reach people at the right time and in the most effective manner so i think the first thing is to create teams with clearly defined roles which negates the need for for us to do what we normally do in real life which is you know which is just having a lot of time to sit down and say who's doing what and all of that just define it um define it once and for all and and define it for the time of the crisis i'm now encouraging a lot of my uh, a lot of my clients are now moving to this as well essentially um, what we are doing is we are mapping newsroom roles against communications roles 
So if you can make your communications team operate like the newsroom, you will probably get to the cycle of publishing a lot faster. Um, for, for years now, I've been saying that we will move towards a, towards a model where the brand becomes its own publisher and it starts to cut out the media middleman. Um, that's not to say that the media are not important. I believe very hugely in their role. It's just that, that there, is, there are narratives that the brand will put out and a frequency with which that often an organization needs to communicate with um, that cannot often be matched by, you know, by what, um, or, or even the demand from the media. So, uh, so brands, a lot, the technology brands really led the way. If you look at virtual newsrooms like Cisco and, um, and Microsoft's newsroom, they just perform like a publisher. Um, so their communications team think like journalists, you know, they have people within the teams that are great at, at curating content. There are people there that are really great at research. There are people that are really great at packaging that content together. Um, as you try to put information out there, it is best to try to map to those roles as well. Look at the people in your organization who have particular skills and then map, the, map accordingly so that people are playing to their strengths and you can work as a more effective oiled machine at this time when you're probably needing to be the publisher yourself. Um, break down the approval structures. Just make them as lean as possible. Um, so just, you know, just uh, have, a, have a really clear sense of, um, so essentially I think the most important thing in all of this is knowing where your potholes is, your potholes are. There is always that one person in that approval struct, in the approvals process that is probably gonna derail something. Know who that person is um, as soon as you possibly can. Um, whether it's somebody in upper management or whether it is somebody within the comms team um, or comms uh, function themselves, know who that person is and get them on side as early as possible. That means saying, here's a playbook. Here's how we're going to operate. Are you bought in? Is this okay? Right. And then that gives you the, that gives you the, um, the freedom then for that every piece of content that you put out or every piece of information doesn't then need to be vetted at, um, at a granular level if you, if you already have a bit of a, of a top line approval. Um, clarity of purpose, mapping all of your, make, making sure that all of your content falls into, is this to inform? Is this because we want people to share this information? Um, is this because we need to educate on a particular topic? Do we need to debunk some misinformation that's out there? Being absolutely sure, because I think sometimes we, we package something up in a certain way. We've written a certain way. We might not put it in the right channel or we might not particularly position it for, um, for consumption the way we want it to be. Um, we worked with an organization some time ago who, um, who had about 100,000 followers on Facebook, but every single post of theirs was getting very, very low engagement. And it was like two likes, you know, maybe one comment if they were lucky. And this is a brand that's actually very loved. And so they were just, it was just very baffling to everybody. And they, um, so they sent us the, 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 the RFP and they said, we'd like you to pitch for this. And we immediately saw what the problem was. And my team and I said, um, can we do something? They said, we will tell you one post to put up. If you put this post up and you change the, the nature of the engagement, don't call an RFP, just give us the work. And it seemed a little bold and they said, right, fine, let's give that a go. Um, and so we gave them the post, we wrote a post and we said, put that up. And they put it up and true enough, there were just like tons of responses. And what was happening was they were actually putting a bunch of information out there, but they weren't having a conversation. And they were, and, and so it was just a lot of, we have this, we have that, this is our this, this is our that. Okay, great, you know, what do you want me to do with that information? So we wrote a post that actually asked a question um, of the of the community and asked a question we knew would be would you know hit people in quite a personal place and people just went boom like you know and responded. So um, so just having that 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 real sense of what do I want drive here? Do I want drive education engagement? What is it? What's your voice and what's the cadence in which you want to communicate? Um, Often you get a situation where brands who are typically wallflowers, organizations who are typically a little bit, you know, um, more 
more quiet uh, thrust into the social party and um and then it's a it's a slightly uncomfortable fit and people are just like oh you know i'm not quite i'm not quite as comfortable putting this much information out there that's fine people don't expect you to be um something else altogether right um when you join the digital party when you are when you are in the social space be clear just let people know this is where we will publish information about da, 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 da. that's it just set the ground rules it's your house right um and um and so essentially essentially if you set the expectations correctly people will know what to what to come to you for and where to go you know for other information um and then just set the expectation of cadence and particularly if you do expect people to come back to you with um with lots of questions and things like that through your social channel this is monitored between these times we will try and respond as quickly as we can and just set that expectation so you don't have somebody going crazy when they don't get a response after 2 hours and you know and then just um creating um a wall of posts on your social page where they just get progressively more frustrated um I don't know if you guys have heard the expression not my circus not my monkeys um when you're in the middle of a crisis it's really important to know if it is your circus and if it, and if it is your monkeys not you don't have to participate in every fight that you're that you are invited to um so just be very clear whether or not something is within your purview um just be very clear whether or not it is something that is that is something that you should be responding on particularly if you are a public sector organization if this is for another organization to answer if this is for somebody else to take just be very clear about that i think that's a question for x you know and um and and if somebody comes to your home your one of your channels and one of your social media profiles for example and tries to bring this fight to you you don't necessarily have to participate send them where they need to be now key success factors in in all of this um establishing credibility now one of the things i often tell clients and and when i speak to people is that your credibility and i think this is really important this is this message is really important for the public sector organizations who see themselves um as authorities on a particular topic your credibility is not guaranteed by your authority on a particular topic in this day and age of information preference i can choose who i decide is credible to me and and you may disagree with it but i may decide that on health matters i don't really i'm not down with reading a white paper from the world health organization you know what that that dr sanjay gupta on cnn i kind of get the way he speaks and that makes sense to me so he's credible to me so so for us to create and establish that credibility with our audience we have to create a right to speak that right to speak again is not guaranteed it is earned so you have to ask yourself what am i delivering of value that is going to make people want to come to me as the source of information now one thing we have seen through this crisis though given the nature of the crisis and the nature of, way, of the way that it is being managed is that people have naturally gravitated towards public sector organizations to lead on this and they have you know they have um said right i'm just going to follow follow um your guidance and your lead on this so uh but again i do want to qu qualify that it is not it is not a right and and you have to establish that credibility and that right to speak creating ecosystems allows you to essentially make sure that that content that you're investing in travels through multiple channels so quite often we will we will spend time going oh let's put out this infographic on instagram and then we forget that we have all of these other places that you know where we can where we can see these things and we can drive a certain level of discussion so do make sure that you are giving yourself um the opportunity to make the most of the content that you are um essentially uh essentially create investing and creating in um appoint someone in your team to be the designated detractor the the person who is most triggered by everything right and tell that person to put everything through the stress test you know everyone is highly triggered anyway um we we're just waiting to be to be outraged by something apparently but more so now um the psychology of most people currently we are actually most psychologists have said that we are actually experiencing something very akin to grief 
And, um, and that is very, you know, that is creating mental states in us that, um, that are unusual, which means that you just never know what it is that is going to tip people a little over the edge. So um, even at the best of times, I, I think a lot of us and particularly public sector organizations are going to feel this, um, that they can't get it right. Whatever they say, someone's going to come along and just go, <sighs> you know, um, yeah, you want me to think that or whatever, right? Whatever the response is going to be. Um, I think particularly at a time like this, it's important to have that one person in the team who you say, right, it's your job to look at this and dissect it and just ask yourself, in what way can this be misunderstood, misinterpreted, or give offense, you know, to any particular group of people? Um, and, and let that person be the stress test for any information that you put out. I believe this is a very important role in communications teams. Um, I believe it's one that isn't very often assigned, um, but I do think that it, that it will gain importance over time. Um, I think they, they, you know, in, in other countries where, um, where diversity is a, is a slightly more advanced conversation, um, they have people that look at these things, but they are, again, only usually looking at these things through a particular lens. Um, you need someone who will overall just be able to have that, that how can anyone take offense um, uh, mindset. Psychographic mapping is the, is the way that we are shifting from away from demographic mapping. So essentially we, we have, um, we used to go, well, I want this to particularly target people who are in age group XYZ, um, who are, you know, who are living in particular places, that sort of thing. We're moving away from that towards, a, towards now a, a situation where essentially we're mapping mindsets and it's more important now than ever before, because as this pandemic goes through a particular life cycle, so will the way that we mentally respond to it. So, um, so what are we mapping to? Are we mapping to people's fear? Are we mapping to concerns about their jobs? Are we mapping to, to economic insecurity? Are we mapping to a recovery phase where people are going to go into a state of mind where they start to slip off thinking everything's okay and we're gonna, things are gonna go back to normal? So, so have a sense of what mentalities you're mapping to and therefore how to speak to those mentalities more than just to say, well, you know what, we need to target a particular demographic right now. Um, and again, this is a time for humane communications. I'll show you some examples of that shortly. Um, but essentially, I think, and this is not to uncut, um, you know, anybody in particular, um, but I truly believe that we're, we're doing it quite right here um, in, in Singapore. Um, essentially, uh, the, the government is, you know, it, and, and perhaps it is a factor of our size and our leanness and things like that. But I think of the multi-channel approach that the government has taken and the speed with which it has been able to produce content has frankly shocked me because I have worked on the other side of this with government agencies where a single tweet has taken us like days to construct and for everyone to be happy with and all of that. But I have seen the government in um, during this time be very, very, very much more um, um, quick about the way um, the way that they are publishing information. Um, the WhatsApp channel, I think, was a bit of a stroke of genius, um, you know, because it just allowed those those quick, timely updates to come through. Um, just short, sharp pieces of, of of information reaching us exactly where we are. The use of infographics, which helps break down complex information for all of us. And then the press conferences, which we can rely on um, to provide those in-depth details and sometimes some humorous moments as well. Um, but, uh, but the press conferences have been, um, have been very reassuring. I think um, that the task force is, is, um, is able to be open and, and address questions and, and provide very detailed, um, very detailed uh, updates to all of us. So essentially, um, the, working in unison, all of these, I think this is one of the examples of, of the way in which communication structures have become agile to their audience, agile to the, to the need for speed in information these days, and agile to the type of information that needs to be published in the various channels in which they are being published as well. Um, essentially, when we're looking at striking the balance between humane and factual communication, one of the best things, I think what, what is a masterclass for me um, at, the mo at the moment is this. If you have a look at the Airbnb CEO's um, announcement, which is published on their website, actually, um, when he announced layoffs, for me, this was a masterclass in so, so many ways. The first is this statement. 
When you asked me about layoffs, I've said nothing is off the table. This is immediately saying, I have been honest with you throughout this whole process. I have been clear with you and consistent with you through this whole process. And finally, when he goes on to say, I'm going to share as many details as I can. If you read that statement, you will see he actually does. He maps out everything very, very clearly. Um, so these are just some of the extracts from that particular statement, which for me are examples of some of the best practice. When he talks about people, he talks about them, about the people leaving, 1,900 of our teammates. That's incredibly humane. Teammates are gonna be leaving Airbnb. To those leaving, he provides the assurance that this is nothing to do with you. This is the world that we live in. And, and anyone, and somewhere else, I think he says, um, somewhere else in the statement, he will say, he says how anywhere that gets you is gonna be so happy to, to have you and is gonna be so lucky to have you. And I think that's, that's amazing. Um, he also maps out the guiding principles. So early in the communication, he says, this is how we thought about what we needed to do. This was our rationale, and now this is what we're doing. And then he had a whole you know, set of, of sections, the process of doing it, the severance arrangements, um, how to manage equity, healthcare and job support that's being provided, very, very detailed. And also just after that, a section saying, at X time we'll be talking to these teams, at X time we'll be talking to these teams. So there was just no questions in anyone's head. And then that, that final statement that, that is just like, everything that is good about us is about, every, you know, is, is, is in honor of, of the people that are, that are leaving us. I mean, that is probably the most humane communication I've seen around job cuts in a very, very um, long time. Um, and finally, when we look at the leadership communication, the um, you know, imperatives at the moment, um, empathy, I don't think this needs to be um, hugely elaborated on. I think we all understand that uh, the nature of this crisis is deeply, deeply personal. Um, I had someone talk to me the other day about the fact that he was having a hard time having a certain audience um, understand the bigger picture. Um, they were just concerned with why are we not getting X, Y, Z things and other people are. And I said, you know, you have to understand that people, while, while yes, there, there are movements out there and people saying we must do more for migrant worker community, for example, and things like that. By and large, a lot of us are in hyper self-preservation mode, which means that, that any communication that we receive, we're just putting it through a personal filter of how does this affect me? Um, fundamentally, this, this crisis affects two things that, 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 um, that totally have the ability to rock our stability, our health and well-being and our livelihoods. And so, so this is what's sending us into hyper-preservation mode, hyper-self-preservation mode. And so this is why sometimes it's really hard for us to see beyond ourselves during this time of crisis. Understanding that and, and understanding that people are just going to be very singularly focused right now and, and just mapping against that um, shows your humanity in this situation as well. Um, open and regular communication and just be setting the right expectation um, from leadership that this is how often you'll hear from me, I think is, um, is particularly, um, is particularly uh, comforting at a time like this. And um, authenticity and accountability speaks to the need for us to, to look to leadership um, as our kind of guiding, guiding force at this point in time. Um, when I talk about accountability, I mean that ultimately whatever decisions is just to stand up and say that, yep, you know, this is, these are the decisions that we made rightly or wrongly. Um, I don't think people have a huge amount of threshold right now for people obfuscating or passing the buck and things like that. Um, it's a difficult time and we just need people to say, yep, that messed up and we didn't get that right and, and here's what we're going to do. Um, leadership these days have to be comfortable with new platforms and new modes of communicating. Um, if your if, um, executives or spokespeople that you're working with do not yet have that training, uh, please set it up for them because they're going to they're going to have to do things in platforms like this, which it's not you know natural for a lot of people, and um, and sometimes they might not come off right just because it's just weird for trying to talking into a little screen and um, and a little camera on a screen. Um, and finally, for for leadership for leadership at the moment. Um, they have to be comfortable in equal parts being the face of crisis and comfort. 
as a CEO or as the head of an organization, you'll be de delivering difficult messages, but you also have to have to steer the ship and, and keep things steady. So, um, so it's, it's, it's not a role that is natural to most leaders. A lot of leaders rise through the ranks for being really good at either making money or, or, or operations. They're not natural communicators. Um, I know this from having trained a lot of them. Um, but, um, you know, it's, um, it's essentially, I think at a time like this, particularly a little bit challenging for them to, to know how to strike that right balance. And all they can do is, is train towards that place as well. Um, I think um, for a good example of this Angela Merkel's um, speech, which she made, I think, um, in March, um, that uh, as, as, the, as the crisis started to peak in, in Germany, took everybody by surprise. She didn't do broadcast addresses. Um, so this was already, a, already really out of the ordinary for her. Um, one person, one commentator described it as searingly empathetic. And I, and I thought that that was quite a beautiful way to say it. Um, while you would expect a leader to come out and go, we are going to do X, Y, Z things here as the game plan. She, she didn't do that. She just came out and said, and, and, and put across really, really deeply personal um, messages about how important everybody was and how important it was that, that everybody was community minded and took care of themselves so that they could take care of others. And, um, and that we could make sure that, um, that uh, you know, co collectively we were safe. One of the quotes from there that I particularly like was how she how she brought it back to her own struggle, and and she just said, you know, I, freedom freedom and and travel of movement were, were things that were a luxury for someone like me, and um, and so I understand when the, that these restrictions are difficult, and I think this is what people look to to leaders as well is to see themselves as one of us at a time like this as well. Though you understand our struggle um, a, as much as you are trying to uh, to navigate us through it. So for me, the, the key takeaways here, um, probably the binding thread across everything is responsible communication. Um, and essentially, uh, this cuts across private, public, and personal. Um, I feel the public sector sits at the heart of all of this at the moment. We have naturally gravitated towards them um, in this time of crisis and asked them to, to be the, 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 you know, the North Star, the guiding light through, through all of this. Um, so we're looking to them to lead and guide. I think um, you know, the public sector is expected to align to and support the government initiatives. Um, that's our expectation from them is, is how, are you going to, how are you going to fall in line? Um, how are you going to support this um, and, um, and how are you then going to, you know, what does that then mean for me? I think on a personal level, though, I, I don't think we, we often don't consider uh, the implications of a simple forward of a piece of information we ourselves have not authenticated. Um, we have very easy ways to do this these, these days um, just by quickly fact checking things online. I think we're all aware of the situation recently um, with someone who stood up to the, um, to the enforcement officers um, in a particular market, um, declaring herself not to have any kind of um, contract with law enforcement. Um, and during that time, um, they had named um, someone else, and you know there was a lot of a lot of uh, speculation going on online about who this person might be. I, when I first received that information, I went and looked up on YouTube the person that was being named, um, and uh, and I could tell it was a completely different voice. It was a completely different accent. It was a, a completely different way of speaking. And I said, this isn't her. And, um, and so I was like, no, in my mind, I'm quite satisfied. But anyway, she's gonna be charged in court tomorrow. So we'll know her, her identity. But that didn't stop a 24 hour news cycle of, of a completely innocent woman's name being dragged all over social media and in forums while people speculated if it was her. I think we have a huge uh, personal responsibility right now to, um, to contribute positively. Um, and if we can't contribute positively to at least filter so that we are not adding to negativity and misinformation at a time like this. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, I know we've covered a lot of ground, probably run a little bit over time, um, but I think I'm gonna turn it over to Ling now. I'm sure there are some questions um, pending.